everyone. Thanks for coming after all the late night parties last night. Um, I'm Alan McConkie. I work at Stainman Design, and I'm also a PhD candidate at University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Uh, so what I'm presenting today is very much work in progress, and I kind of wish that there were more people in the room to hear that part, because I'm sure everyone's going to come in and then judge me that this is final work, you know, when everyone shows up five minutes later. Um, so this is stuff that I really have been working on the last few years, on and off, uh, as I'm trying to get my dissertation finished. Um, and I'm really looking at how editing behavior in OpenStreetMap changes over time. Um, I am looking at this idea of what happens after a decade of OpenStreetMap, now that we're certainly past, in many parts of the world, we're past that phase of filling in the empty map. Um, there's still a lot of empty spaces on the map, but parts of OpenStreetMap, depending on what you're looking at, could be considered finished. Uh, the road networks are done in a lot of cities. Uh, they're routable. There's addresses and buildings in a lot of cities, too. Um, what happens looking into the future of OpenStreetMap? How is it going to be maintained? How will it be sustainable um, 20, 30 years down the road? What does editing OpenStreetMap look like after it's mostly been filled in, after we move perhaps into a, a maintenance phase? Um, or does that even exist? So these are all questions that I'm working with uh, in my dissertation um, and are trying to answer today. So some of these questions and, um, are about who are these people who first mapped OpenStreetMap? Are they still around? So questions of uh, the user, user persistence in the database. Um, how, does the activities, how do the activities change? So even if those users are still around, do their tasks change? Do they start modifying things more than adding new things? Um, or are there different users who do those modifications and those maintenance tasks versus the people who maybe are only interested in exploring new things, filling in new data? And that was, those were the kind of questions that I started out my dissertation. And as I tried to work through those questions, I ended up, I had to keep dealing with this question of imports, um, which seems like this third point seems like it's slightly different from those other two questions. But if we assume that as OpenStreetMap gets filled in in some sense, and that new users who come later on in the project arrive to an already filled in map, is that that much different from starting as an OpenStreetMap US contributor in 2008 after the Tiger import. Does it feel that different um, to someone who joins OpenStreetMap in London today to see an already filled in map? So this idea of whether imported data, especially in the US, whether that hindered the growth of the OSM community in the US is this ongoing debate within the, the community that hasn't really been settled. And I'm not going to be able to settle it here, but I'm going to try and get in that direction of, of see, can we talk about um, how the OSM community has changed over time in different places based on whether there were imports or not, and so on. So we don't really need to, I don't need to tell you all in this audience the, the scale of what the Tiger import was, how big it was at the time. That spike over there in the, on the left of pink um, nodes was when Tiger was imported into OSM. And at that time, it was vastly outnumbered any other data that was in OSM at that time. Um, the, that fix spike over there on the left is, again, the amount of nodes that were being added each day. So Tiger was, uh, was being added to the OSM database at a rate that OSM did not really reach until many years later. But we also forget that there's been plenty of other imports that have happened over time, um, not just Tiger, not just at the beginning. Buildings, and a lot of these were incomplete. This is Mass GIS in 2009. Um, addresses have been added in Denmark, but without buildings. Land cover has been added in sometimes entire countries, sometimes smaller areas. Some places like Canada, where I'm doing my dissertation research, is very chunky and incomplete in terms of it, the imported data. Um, people got started and then kind of left it off. And so in the community, there's also been this backlash, which I don't really need to tell you too much about. But um, I've just got a few examples of quotes of some of the things that people are concerned with. Um, Here's, here's this idea of, you don't have to read the entire quote, but some of the highlights. Here's a mapper who got really pissed off when someone imported a lot of data on top of his work and broke his work. So this is an example of a badly done import. So he's concerned with the quality of the work, but also that it removed this human intelligence, that he, kn he knew the area really well. Now everything's been obliterated and bollocked up. Um, he's really pissed off. We have other points of view, or other ways of articulating this uh, view somewhat against imports. 
um, Frederick Ram arguing that really that in 40 years, maybe even 15, the data doesn't matter so much. It's more the community that we've built, the practices that we've built. Um, it's not, we don't want OSM, in his view, to be uh, this database where a few smart guys figured out how to combine existing data sets. He thinks it should be made by hand, by themselves. And then finally, here's a recent quote uh, that articulates perhaps a stereotype view of the import versus non-import um, position. And it tends to break down along um, national lines, regional lines as well. So there's this idea that in uh, the United States, we didn't have this fun task of mapping the unknown. We only had a bunch of tiger data that was pretty boring and, and tedious to clean up. Meanwhile, a place like Germany is held up as the example of a really strong community where everything has been collected by volunteers, where they got to have fun mapping that unknown. Um, this is, of course, not quite as simple, but this is kind of the, the prevailing wisdom in OpenStreetMap. And as a result, the best practice for imports these days is to try to engage the community, to try to use it as an opportunity to build, um, to build more community rather than to hopefully uh, preempt it. So Seattle um, really pioneered this, splitting up building data into little chunks, having mappers on the ground import each bit at a time, having a bunch of meetups where you develop community around this import. New York City followed a similar example. Um, I think Seattle was pretty much all volunteer, but New York City is an example of, of a lot of the Mapbox paid editors because it's a huge task to, to import all this data. Um, and they did it with, cons with consultation, not always smoothly, with the community trying to develop, um, to develop uh, the New York City community rather than to just drop something on top of them. Tools like the Tasking Manager really help with that. Okay, so some of the questions restated, um, thinking about imports in particular, and the kind of things that I'm gonna try to address with the more quantitative piece of the rest of the presentation. Um, so how did Tiger affect the local communities? Um, how did they grow and evolve differently? Can we, can we measure how they uh, grow, grew and evolved differently than other cities that didn't have Tiger? Can we look at recent imports to think about how that, what that might tell us about um, what Tiger was like or how they might be different from Tiger. And more broadly, I just want to be able to compare different, different case studies around the world to see how OSM has really evolved differently in these specific cases with different communities, different um, cultural contexts, different technical and economic contexts and, context and so on. But the way I'm going to try to ask that of the database um, is to get at that original question of how important is that moment of filling in those blank spots on the map? So I'm, I'm, there's multiple ways that you could uh, go after these questions, um, doing a quantitative analysis, but um, this is the way I'm trying to figure out those, that trailblazing moment, that filling in the blank spot that, we, that a lot of the OSM um, rhetoric believes is important to having an engaged community, important to having higher quality data. How important is that? Well, that filling in the blank spot is something that we can test, we can detect, and then see how um, users who have gotten that opportunity behave over time, and how those who did not get that opportunity also behave. Okay, so here's a bunch of like how I went about doing this. Um, I'm using the, the full OSM history dump, but I'm extracting a small number of study areas. I would love to maybe use the MapSense platform to do this whole, for the whole world, you know, soon, or um, this is just something that I was working on uh, on one machine, um, doing it on my own, my dissertation, starting this a few years ago. But now I'm using the history dump up to the end of 2014. And I'm only gonna look at nodes, just to make things easier on myself. Um, that does include nodes that are parts of, of ways. So not just POIs, but I'm loading in using the, um, the uh, Masterminds OSM history splitter and importer and just looking at the nodes table. So any node that is a freestanding POI or part of a, of a way is included. And then I'm overlaying a grid over each of these study areas. Just a one kilometer grid, it's kind of an arbitrary choice to, to capture a bit of the nuance of the, of, uh, the urban environment. Um, and I'm finding the very first node in each of those grid cells. 
So these are what I'm calling that blank spot edit. These are the people who are, who are trailblazing the map. If you have if you've ed the first one to edit in an area where there's no other data in that square kilometer, then I'm, I'm saying you are one of those trailblazers. And then I'm totaling up um, all of the other stats about each of these users in each area. So the total number of nodes, the number of first nodes, whether or not they're in a blank spot or not, the number of edits, and so on. So here's what it would look like in central London. This is just loading up the database with every line, every linear feature ever, a one kilometer grid, and finding the first node in each of those grid cells. So this is what I'm doing in each of my case studies. And here's what it looks like in Vancouver. Um, there's a lot more work that I want to do and could do about calibrating this grids for the, the urban, the built environment of a city. Obviously, city blocks are different in different places. Um, as we get from the center of a city to the more rural areas, maybe that one kilometer distance doesn't make sense um, to capture what it feels like to map the unknown. And for those of you who are at State of the Map US two years ago in San Francisco, I um, presented some of the work that I was doing back then um, using some of the earlier data that I was generating from this. These are some visualizations that I'm not going to spend too much time on um, in this presentation, but this is just another way of trying to think about what does that landscape of users look like in a particular city? So if each of these dots is one user who edited somewhere in greater London, the size is the number of days active, the size of the dot, but then the scale on each axis is the number, total number of nodes they edited along to the right, and then up is the total number of those blank spot edits, those trailblazing edits that they got to do. So if we look way in the upper right, those are people who edited many days, um, they edited a ton of nodes overall, but they also were the ones who were filling in the blank spots on the map at the beginning of the project. And then of course, along the bottom, those are log scales, so whenever there's a number one, it really should be red zero. Um, along the bottom, those are all the people who arrived after the kind of beginning of the project. They never got to map into the blank spot on the map. But if we look at a city that had a tiger import, like San Francisco Bay Area, we see way in the upper right, those are some tiger import accounts. Tons of nodes, also tons of those blank spots, they filled in the map before anyone else arrived, but they're not active very many days. They were just used a few days for an import. And then the human contributors are much more down lower to the right. So they've added a lot of nodes, but they weren't there at the beginning filling in those spots. So this hopefully that, that will help you figure out what these, these statistics that I'm talking about kind of mean. Um, and I've got some more time series charts a little bit later. And, and of course, figuring out the right bounding boxes for cities is a pain, and comparing between different cities is a pain because different population densities in Europe versus the US and so on. All right, now, this is the part that's really in progress. I have a ton of these charts that I'm trying to make sense of, and maybe you in this room will help me make sense, sense of these. Um, so I have about 30 different case study cities that I picked for various reasons, trying to get some European cities that had imports and did not have imports, some US cities, some Canadian cities as a kind of control to look at what the North American urban population density city structure looks like without having a tiger import. Because you could make the argument that the reason we don't have a, as strong a mapping community in the US is just maybe things are farther apart. Maybe our cities are less exciting to map because they're all rectangular suburbs instead of um, the interesting nuances of most European cities. Like there's all kinds of other reasons. So I'm grabbing a bunch of different cities to try to compare, try to look at what these patterns look like differently across different cities. And we just see, first of all, just looking at the number of total nodes in each city all these spikes are where imports happened or where the Haiti earthquake happened and we had a ton of nodes that were all um, added by human contributors all in one month. We can also see that a lot of later imports are spread out. Uh, the, it's in yellow, you can't really see it very well, but in Paris, they took a couple years to import data. Um, in Seattle, there's a little red spike on the right, short one, they imported their data over several months. And if we look at node modifications, so this is not anything contributed uh, that's brand new to the map. This is adding um, different, uh, different tags, moving nodes around. Um, we can see 
there's no version two edits, uh, nodes that have version two tagged on them before mid-2007. That's when there was an API change. Um, so the history wasn't completely lost, but the version numbers were reset at that point. So there's no version two before that point. But we see that there's also a lot of spikes in modifications. Uh, I know I still need to uh, filter out or find some way to identify uh, where these are fixing, uh, these are bots that are fixing things and changing things. That may be why a lot of these modifications happen in, in a single month. And then those blank spot edits. So these are the, the filling in the map edits. Um, we see a ton of spike for all those US cities that I have in the database all at the same time. That was a Tiger import. We see actually two spikes for Haiti. Um, a year before the earthquake, uh, there was a, a bunch of data added because of a few typhoons, uh, a few hurricanes that hit ha um, Haiti in 2009. But every other city in my database doesn't have any of these spikes for the new nodes being added. They're much slower. We don't see it. We basically see the map gets filled in over many months at a time. I also have been trying to normalize by area and by population, but um, and you see different spikes, things like Amsterdam are popping up. But for, to make it easier to, to uh, get familiar with these slides, I'm just going to skip over those. So I'm trying to also figure out how we can tease apart an individual city. Instead of looking at London overall, its total nodes, the new nodes, the modified ones, the blank spots, they're all, these lines are all pretty pale. Apologize for that. What if we tracked, uh, charted how every individual user who had ever edited in London looks like on this chart. Um, the top line is the total again. All of the users who are drawn in red are ones who mapped blank spots. They were those trailblazers. And then there's a bunch of pale blue lines. Those are the people who joined later and uh, started to become more active as those original mappers tailed off. So this is just to, to the, this one's to familiarize with what it looks like as I split uh, the as I map individual users, and now I'm trying um, and uh, to communicate what it looks like if we group those users back into two, um, two subsets. Basically, whether or not you are one of those trailblazing mappers, the blank spot contributors, or whether you came later and or were not interested in mapping those blank spots and you were only adding where, where other stuff was already on the map. So what we see are the, the first, um, the, the solid line, which you can't really see very well, is those who mapped the blank spots. And then there's a dotted line that is much higher near more recent years, um, showing the non-blank spot editors. The other thing to notice, the number of users in each group. Um, there were only 130 people in Greater London who mapped into the unknown, and there's 5,000 above who have arrived later and, and have perhaps as many edits, but um, they didn't map in the unknown. The thing is, the, there's definitely a power law effect, that those 130 are much more active in total than all of those 5,000 who came later. Berlin shows a similar pattern. Those, those first mappers are still sort of active, but gradually you see more people join. Um, and then in 2014, there's a huge spike of new mappers who are adding all kinds of um, new nodes. I have no idea what's going on in Berlin in 2014. Um, I would love to talk with any, someone who's more familiar with that. They're like this sudden spike um, of activity in 2014. So some of my Canadian case studies showed basically that the people who mapped the blank spots, who were the, the original mappers, are still around, and they're still the ones who are doing most of the work. Um, this perhaps suggests that those cities have not grown to bring in more of a, of a community. Toronto shows it, Vancouver shows it. There's a few spikes, but basically the, the dotted line showing uh, the, that new cohort, they never really are as active as the original mappers. So that's a, that's a bit of a surprise. Um, we see in a city in North America where they didn't really have an import that uh, they're not 
growing with new, new people joining the map in the same way that they are in places like London and Berlin. So the growth of the community in Canada seems to be suppressed, but there's no tiger import that caused that. Perhaps it is something to do with just North America, how, we're, how our, art, our outreach works, um, the, the strength of the open source community here, maybe it's not as strong as in Europe. Um, for whatever reason, there's been less growth of the communities in places like Toronto and Vancouver than there would be in perhaps a similar city in Europe that also did not have an import. A few slides of Haiti. I'm still working out how uh, non-imported large dumps of data um, might look similar or not similar. So in the case of Haiti, it, for the people on the ground, it might have felt just like an import. A ton of data added all at once from people who were not there on the ground. Um, but as we also see, a place like Haiti, um, the, the economic differences are, are certainly considerable. We wouldn't expect as much of a local community to be growing, perhaps, as, as in North America or Europe. And finally, let's look at some of these US case studies. So this is where I'm really still, my work is ongoing, trying to understand um, how these charts can uh, communicate what the effectiveness or um, non-effectiveness of different types of imports on how the community is developing. Um, so these are total nodes created. We see the Tiger imports over there in late 2007. In 2009, there's a big blue spike, which was the building import in Boston. And these are just the four cities. Orange is the Bay Area, green is Seattle, uh, red is New York, and purple is Boston. Then we definitely see those building imports that have happened in the last few years. The Boston, there's a new import in 2013 in Boston that was also imported by just one person. So we can, we can use that to compare against these cases like Seattle or New York where it was these community-led imports. Boston was really doing the same thing as we did in Tiger. One person ran the import from their account. The green spikes, the short ones, that's that Seattle building import. But what's interesting is that that's a solid line, meaning that all of the people who are involved in the Seattle building import, all of those people who we, we saw at those screenshots of the meetup that were trying to build that community, those were all people who did have blank spot edits. So those were people active in 2013 who also at some point, um, back in the very early days of the project, found blank spots to edit even with the Tiger import. So that community um, building of Seattle, well, is really maybe strengthening a community that was already there, that had already been active as early as 2007. And the red lines of the New York import, there's two spikes there. Those are all dotted lines, meaning that the people involved in the New York import, none of those were old timers. None of those were people who were part of the community at the beginning of OSM. They were all um, new members, many of them Mapbox employees, but also new citizens, uh, new participants um, from the community in New York who were not old timers. And the modifications as well. So the, some of the things I'm, so, I'm finding from this, just to, to wrap up, um, yeah, that the power law is really trumping everything else. So there's still, that just comes out in any analysis you do of OSM. There's always a small group that is doing most of the edits. And it turns out that mostly that's a small group who are at the beginning of the project. Um, we're seeing in places like London and Berlin a gradual and expected shift to new contributors. We would expect at, over time some um, new people to join the project. Not so in Canada, and so is that also the case in the US? When we filter out the, the Tiger data, it's hard to tell. We're seeing a subtle shift to maintenance tasks, but people are still finding new things to add. So the new nodes are always remain high, even today. So we're not at the point where we filled in the map, there's nothing left to edit, we have to continue just to modify things or maintain them. People are adding buildings, they're adding POIs. There's always new things to add, so maybe the sense of there's always some exploring to do. There's always some blank spots, no matter how you conceive of it, to add to the map. And then do the imports hinder the growth of community? It's still not clear, and it's, this is making it seem like it's much more complicated than we might think. It's not as obvious, especially when we look at those Canadian cases. Maybe there's something more to do with culture and um, the population density and so on. All right, thank you. I maybe have a little bit of time for questions. I have, um, the, the, these charts are a work in progress. Uh, it's gonna take a long time to load. It's not very efficient. Maybe someone wants to help me and I'll give you a thanks on, in my dissertation. But um, you can look at those time series 
online with that URL. And I'm going to be adding more features so you can do the, some of the filtering that I've been doing. Um, and thank you. Uh, please, I want this to be a conversation with, with the community. If any of my assumptions don't resonate with, with the average OSM mapper on the ground, I want to hear about it. And I want that conversation to, to go on. Uh, yes. People are editing OSM near where they live, but there's a community in, like, in Seattle that only edits in Seattle, and like, seems anecdotally right. But have you done any like research into where people are editing based on where they live, or has anybody? And then I guess I have another question in that blank spot seems like a good metric to figure out this what you're trying to get out. But another sort of confounding thing is maybe just people who started editing OSM back in 2007 are just were around and like are old timers and so like to stay around and it doesn't it's not necessarily the fact that they were editing in a new region because they're just like they were old timers and so they feel like invested in the project so there's just two questions I thought of. Yeah so the questions were the first question was um, whether or not I, I have an assumption about the people who live in a city are the ones editing there um, and yeah I'm not I'm not testing for that although I can and I and I should and I would love to. Um, right now, I'm only looking at the edits that a person made in that area. So for all I know, the people doing that Seattle import had 99% of their edits elsewhere. I don't know. Um, it's probably the case for many of those New York mappers. I know anecdotally, knowing some of those usernames, that the Mapbox employees have been working everywhere. Um, I don't know whether that fits into any, any of the, I'm trying not to make assumptions, at least in this research, about whether or not that pride of place is changing how people are, are acting. So if you are an early mapper in London, but you don't live there, my analysis doesn't really care if you have, a, like, if you have an attachment to London and you're going to continue mapping it, or if you have an attachment to Haiti. If you don't live there, then that's still OK for this analysis. But that would be something I can do just by you know, getting people's edit counts elsewhere, and then um, something I'm really quite interested in doing, especially in the, in the Haiti case. Kind of, yeah, yeah, um, and and there has been a, a little bit of academic research in that direction. I can, um, I, but I don't recall who off the top of my head. Um, and then the second question, what was the second question again? Um, around in the beginning, like to stay right. active. Right. So the the people who are around at the beginning, um, is that is the importance of the blank spot edit that important, or is it just important that they were around at the beginning? Maybe so, and that would be something really interesting to to test. So people in London in 2007 who were finding new suburbs, mapping new streets. Maybe there were also old timers active in London who didn't care about mapping new suburbs and they were adding the post boxes after each person added a street. So there could have been this sense of gardening or supplementing the map happening even back then. Um, and, and that is something that I could also find a way to test for, which would be really quite interesting because uh, especially how the exploring versus the gardening happens today versus how it would happen then are going to be really interesting questions thinking about the future. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm, I'm all the way over time. All right. Thank you. Let's, let's continue the conversation afterward. Thanks.